Intravenous regional anesthesia, or IVRA, is a classic technique for anesthetizing the forearm or leg for a short time and a great alternative to procedural sedation or a brachial plexus block. It's reliable, inexpensive, safe, and easy. And in this video, we'll go over the hows, whens, and whys of IVRA. IVRA involves exsanguinating a limb, inflating a tourniquet, and then replacing the blood with dilute local anesthetic by injecting through an indwelling intravenous catheter. You're essentially pickling the arm temporarily with local. There are two ways this works to anesthetize the tissues. First, the local anesthetic finds its way to the nerve branches, median, radial, ulnar, etc., via the vase novorum and produce a direct nerve block. The second is by diffusion through the tissues to nerve endings in the skin, muscle, fascia, and bone. Both work in concert to produce excellent conditions for surgery or manipulation of the limb. This block is also called a beer block, and no, not that kind. In 1908, August Beer invented IVRA by isolating a section of a limb with two Esmark bandages and injecting procaine. It worked well, but it didn't really take off because of concern over systemic toxicity. It wasn't until 1963 that Mac Holmes, a New Zealand anesthesiologist, described his method of using 0.5% lidocaine, a method that is virtually unchanged today. IVRA has several advantages as a procedural analgesic technique. First, it's reliable, virtually 100% effective, with no patchy spots or incomplete sensory block. It also provides excellent muscle relaxation. Second, it's got a rapid offset. For short surgical procedures, fracture reductions, or other distal limb procedures, it lasts for 30 to 60 minutes, and then it's gone, so you don't have to worry about a patient having a floppy, insensate limb for hours and hours. Because of that, you can also do bilateral procedures, carpal tunnel releases, for example, and the patient can use their hands afterwards. It's very safe, provided you follow the few procedural rules that we'll explain shortly. Systemic toxicity is very rare with proper technique. And finally, if you can do an IV and manage to inflate and deflate a tourniquet, you can do IVRA. You don't need special training in ultrasound-guided brachial plexus blocks. There are things to think about with IVRA. The duration is limited practically by tourniquet pain, and for that reason, we tend to use it for cases that will last fewer than 60 minutes or so. Also, once a tourniquet is deflated, the block goes away completely, so it's best reserved for indications that don't have moderate to severe post-operative pain. IVRA is excellent for brief procedures on the distal hand, wrist, forearm, or the foot and ankle, including fracture reduction, laceration repair, and burn care of the extremity. This technique has also been used to treat complex regional pain syndrome using a variety of different anti-adrenergic agents, but the evidence supporting this is quite limited. On the other hand, IVRA is relatively contraindicated in several conditions that predispose to thrombosis, like those listed here. Okay, so what do we need to do this? Well, we'll first need a tourniquet, one that's appropriately sized for the patient's arm or thigh. This technique is best done with a double cuff, a tourniquet with two cuffs that can be inflated and deflated independently. In a pinch, a single cuff will do, but as we'll see later, the patient will complain of tourniquet pain earlier. In addition to a working IV somewhere else in the body, we'll need to place an intravenous cannula in the operative limb, preferably somewhere distal like the back of the hand. Some clinicians like a butterfly for its flat profile, and some like a catheter over needle cannula to avoid leaving a sharp needle inside the vein during exsanguination. Both have pros and cons. We'll also need an Esmark bandage, named after Friedrich von Esmark, a professor of our friend August Beer. And we'll need an appropriate volume, concentration, and type of local anesthetic. Our preference is to use 0.5% lidocaine. Finally, we always mark our block site with the word block, so we have a marker handy. Okay, here's how we do this in 10 easy steps. First, you'll need IV access somewhere else on the body, not the operative limb, and the patient monitored in the usual way. The first step is to apply a stockingette or some padding to the arm to protect it from the tourniquet. Next, we're going to take our double cuff tourniquet and apply it over the padding. The tourniquet tubing is connected to the appropriate chamber on the compressor unit. Usually these are color-coded, in this case, red and blue. But just to make it even more error-proof for ourselves, we're going to label the machine with proximal and distal to match our cuff orientation. The inadvertent deflation of the wrong tourniquet at the wrong time can lead to serious consequences. Next, we'll place a 22-gauge IV at a distal site, usually in the dorsum of the hand. We'll attach it to a short length of IV tubing and secure it to the skin. Now we'll want to exsanguinate the limb. We'll do this in two ways. The first is passive, by lifting the arm up and holding it there for a minute, allowing for venous drainage. 
but the real exsanguination is done by applying a stretchy Esmark bandage tightly around the fingers and hand, and then winding it proximally, squeezing the remaining blood out of the vasculature. Overlap each turn of the Esmark by 50% to ensure consistent progressive pressure from distal to proximal. While holding the Esmark tight, the cuffs are then inflated to at least 250 millimeters of mercury or 100 millimeters of mercury above systolic pressure. Now the order matters. First, inflate the distal cuff, the blue one in this case. Make sure to palpate it to ensure it is indeed inflated. Then inflate the proximal or red cuff. Check this one too. Then we're going to deflate the distal cuff. Here's why that sequence works for us. Before the cuffs are inflated, we have blood in that part of the limb. Inflating the distal cuff with the Esmark applied squeezes the blood proximally. Then inflating the proximal cuff does the same thing. We could leave it like this, but one advantage of the double cuff is that we can deflate the distal side and allow local anesthetic to enter that part of the arm. Later in the procedure, if the patient experiences tourniquet pain from cuff A, we can inflate cuff B over the already anesthetized tissues. Okay, now we're ready to remove the Esmark. Step nine, we're almost there. We're gonna administer the local anesthetic now. It's not a bad idea to check for pulses as a final confirmation that the tourniquet is functioning. Then we'll take our syringe of 0.5% lidocaine and begin to inject through the indwelling IV. The injection should be slow. Aim for about 90 seconds to avoid exceeding the tourniquet pressure. And finally, once we've injected the volume we want, the IV is removed and pressure held at the site for one to two minutes. You should expect to get a complete sensory and motor block within five minutes. The safety of this technique is dependent on the local anesthetic being sequestered in the limb for enough time for it to bind to tissues. For that reason, you should never deflate the tourniquet before 30 minutes. There's no maximum inflation time. It's dependent on the comfort of the patient. After about 45 to 60 minutes, many patients will begin to experience tourniquet pain or discomfort. When that happens, we inflate the distal cuff. Remember, the tissues underneath it are now anesthetized. Once we've checked it's properly inflated, we'll deflate the proximal cuff, which relieves the tourniquet pain, giving you another 15 to 30 minutes. The most popular local anesthetic for IVRA in the U.S. is lidocaine. There are various recipes out there with different concentrations and volumes, but we find the following easy, safe, and effective. For upper limb procedures, use 40 mils of 0.5% lidocaine. And for lower limb procedures with a thigh tourniquet, use 100 mils. Some parts of the world use prilocaine, which is also very safe and effective. The dose? Turns out it's the same. 40 mils of 0.5% for upper limb and 100 mils for lower limb. Easy to remember. Prilocaine can provoke methemoglobinemia, so be aware and keep some methylene blue on hand, but this typically occurs in very large doses, over 600 milligrams. So those are our two safe and effective local anesthetics. There have been others used, but they should be used with caution. Mepificaine is effective, but is a potent vasoconstrictor and should be avoided in patients with compromised circulation or CRPS. Chlorprocaine is okay, but has a higher incidence of venous irritation and urticaria. Long-acting local anesthetics just should not be used. There have been fatal IVRA complications with pipivacaine especially, and if you're that concerned about increasing the duration of the block, just do a brachial plexus block instead. When the procedure is over and it's been at least 30 minutes, it's time to deflate the cuffs. Most recommend a staged deflation to prevent a sudden washout of local anesthetic into the central circulation. Deflate for 10 seconds, then reinflate the cuff. Wait one minute while watching the patient for signs and symptoms of last. Repeat this two more times for a total of three cycles. The patient should be recovered from the block in about five minutes. Here are some IVRA tips. First, this is mostly an upper limb technique. Yes, it's used for lower limbs sometimes, but it tends to have a higher incidence of poor quality block. This may have to do with tourniquet fit in the larger thigh, or the fact that there are more interosseous channels that remain open in the thigh, allowing leakage of local anesthetic. If you're planning IVRA for foot and ankle surgery, consider a calf tourniquet and using half the dose. Second, some use adjuvants to the local anesthetic to squeeze a little more analgesia out of the block and possibly decrease tourniquet pain. In general, these add complexity, the chance for a drug error, side effects such as hypotension and sedation, and in the end, most have just been shown not to do all that much. If you're going to use an adjuvant, Ketorolac 20 mg seems to have the best benefit to risk ratio. Otherwise, we recommend just keeping it simple and using plain local anesthetic. Multimodal agents like ketamine and dexamethasone are wonderful, but when using them in addition to IVRA, we suggest just using the intravenous route. 
Finally, if the patient has an injury that precludes the use of a tight Esmark bandage, you can exsanguinate the arm using digital occlusion of the axillary artery for three to five minutes while the arm is elevated. This provides good operating conditions without causing the patient additional discomfort. IVRA is an old technique that has stood the test of time. It's safe, virtually 100% effective, and easy to perform, and for those reasons will always have a place in the pantheon of regional block techniques.